um, mm. and you owe your life, it is believed, they say, to, to Islam. And also many de really debilitating um, laws uh, that greatly disadvantage uh, the Christians and, and other religious groups that keeps them in a position of uh, inferiority and great weakness. And this system is a kind of a, a two, two qualities of people. There's Muslims who are superior and non-Muslims who are inferior. And uh, it creates a system which is very cruel and difficult uh, for non-Muslims. So if that is a part of the reality, if I can use that word, uh, of an Islamic nation, what can we do? How can that be changed? It seems to me there'd have to be a profound change in governance. And if you have an Islamic-dominated government, however that may manifest itself, how do you make sure that, as we say here in the United States, all men are created equal and should be treated equally? Well, we can put pressure on Islamic countries in Egypt, uh, it's extremely difficult for a church to be built or repaired. Um, that's one of the principles of this pact of surrender, that you're not supposed to build or repair churches. And, and uh, there have been um, uh, there was recently a demonstration of, of Christians that was assaulted by 5,000 uh, police from the, from the Egyptian government, and they arrested more than 100 of them. Some were killed. They were just protesting to be able to build a, a, a building for their church's use. Now... Um, it, it, it's outrageous that you can't build a church in a country where Christians have been living for 2,000 years. It's their own native, native land, um, and it's very, very difficult for them. And uh, there are mosques going up all over America, but apparently you can't repair a church in, in, in Egypt. Now, as it happens, uh, Egypt is a huge uh, recipient of American aid, and uh, we should be putting pressure on them to, uh, uh, to do a better deal for their Christians and not to treat them as second-class citizens. So we do have leverage. We have an opportunity to say this is just not acceptable. We're concerned about what's happening with Christians yes. in your country. Yes. Well, let me go to one that's obviously in the front pages of most of the world's papers, and that's the situation going on in Afghanistan. What happens now to an Afghan who comes to faith in Christ Jesus? Uh, the law of Afghanistan says that he should be killed um, if he leaves Islam. And there have been a number of cases where people have either been killed or have had to flee the country. And uh, there's a crackdown happening in Afghanistan at the moment. In fact, the speaker uh, on the floor of the Afghanistan uh, parliament in uh, the middle of the past year said that if anyone leaves Islam, they should be killed. Um, and that's that's the constitution of Afghanistan now. Sharia law is the is the is the law. So it's uh, very dangerous to be publicly declare yourself a Christian in Afghanistan. Hmm. Sylvia Mark sent a very interesting email. She wants to know: Do you have to modify your message when you go to speak in Canada? And given that there are human rights commissions there, I'm wondering, and not really the same timber of free speech that we enjoy here in the United States. Do you have to change your message a bit when you speak in Canada? Yes, I won't. But uh, you do have to be aware that they have these anti-vilification laws, and the Canadians are uh, um, perhaps more reticent to talk about these issues. Um, I'm very careful to stay on topic and to justify everything I say. I also uh, always strongly encourage people to love Muslims and to care for, for their interests and concerns and not to hate them. Um, but I won't back off from the truth, even though uh, it will be challenging for them. Um, but I'll have a whole day and I'll have the time to, <laughs> to lay out the issues so they'll understand. I, often I just quote from Muslims and let people think about what Muslims themselves say. Um, and, uh, and and uh, it's obviously qu usually quite clear to people what's what's going on when they see those what Muslims themselves say. Mark, when you take something that's in darkness and you expose it to the disinfectant of light, sometimes there's a pushback. Have you ever had any threats against you because of what you do and what you say? I, ex Janet, I have not had personal threats. I, I have friends that have, um, but I haven't myself. Uh, I, I am careful in a sense of always staying on topic and uh, not making sort of gratuitous comments. Um, but uh, it, is a, it is a concern. Uh, anyone who speaks critically about Islam could attract attention from, from violent people. Um, and uh, I think many people are afraid of, of, of Islam for that reason. I've known of people in Australia who've lost their lives because of their work mm in witnessing to Christ, uh, to the Muslim community. Uh, so I, I take that seriously, but that's not going to shut me up. Amen. And that's a role model for the rest of us. Raman, thank you for joining us. Your comment or question for Dr. Dury, please. 
Uh, hello, I just want to say thank you and uh, th I thank your guest for uh, this uh, wonderful program. And uh, he, he, what all what he's talking about is right, and he's the voice of William of non-Muslims who are living in Muslim countries and who are suffering from Sharia law and getting persecuted or getting killed just because of Sharia law. And uh, uh, we see that the uh, people in Western Europe and in the United States, they don't uh, receive this message. Uh, they don't receive this message and they don't, they don't understand uh, what the real Islam is. And uh, the real Islam is uh, all what um, is nothing is just only killing people and persecuting others who are non-Muslims. I think the caller has, has raised a really important point that Christians in Muslim countries are often silenced. They're unable to speak out against what's happening. And I uh, attended a, a, a memorial service in Melbourne recently in Australia for the, the uh, 23 cops that were killed in the, in the um, uh, New Year's Eve bombing in, in Alexandria. And um, some of the young people there uh, from Egypt, they're saying, we are speaking out because our friends and relatives in Egypt can't. And they are, they are not able to speak often because of the threats to their lives. But we do live in a free country, and we need to speak up. And I believe the Lord Jesus, when he comes again, will ask us. will ask us. He'll say, did you speak up? Did you visit them? He said, did you give them a glass of water when they were thirsty? Well, um, I can't go all the way to every country and give everyone a glass of water. But here I am. I can speak up about the reality of what's happening in this situation. So we have a responsibility to speak up and be the voice of the persecuted church. Yes, yes, could not agree more. Raman, thank you so. Appreciate your being a part of our conversation. One eight seven seven live 675 to Florida now. Russ, thank you for joining us. Your question now, please. Hi. Um, well, I'm not sure how to ask what I want to ask, but uh, I've heard that the faith of Islam believes that it's okay to lie as long as it's beneficial to their cause. Now, is that true? Russ, and that's if a, so, how can we believe what they say? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, it all goes back to Muhammad. There were certain circumstances where Muhammad lied. And based on that, Muslims believe he's the best example. Laws and rules have been developed that describe when it's uh, uh, required or, or allowed to lie and when it isn't. Basically, lying is a sin, but there are circumstances where it's a, it's a virtue. And um, there are a number of different circumstances. For example, husbands are allowed to lie to their wives to maintain marital harmony. You're allowed to lie in warfare. Um, and also to help people be happy with each other. If there's a dispute between your neighbours, you can lie to them. Um, it's quite specific, the circumstances, but one of them which the, is defined in the Quran is that when Muslims are in a minority position and are dependent upon the protection of non-Muslims, they're allowed to deceive the non-Muslims. Um, one of the great commentators said, we smile at them in their faces while we hate them in our hearts. Mm -hmm. And this, is, this particular doctrine is called taqiyya, it means to cover, and uh, it makes it quite difficult. And I've certainly heard testimony of stories of people that have left Islam saying they had Muslim friends that would quite openly say that they would say one thing to, to uh, ordinary Christian Americans and another thing when they weren't present. And I think as regards to knowing when people are speaking the truth or not, you have to be quite um, sensitive and, and pay attention and listen carefully. Um, and see, uh, sometimes pay attention to what they say in a different context. If there's someone in a mosque who's speaking in English in the local church and saying one thing, uh, it's really good to get some re you know, recordings of his sermons in other contexts and try and put him into context. But we, we mustn't assume that, they, that people are just working from the sa singing from the same hymn sheet that we are. Barbara, you are in Ohio. I thank you so for joining us. Your question now, please, from Mark Dury. Yes, I'm wondering if it might not be helpful or what... Dr. Dury thinks about uh, the helpfulness of uh, us writing the embassies of countries that are persecuting Christians and just a polite letter saying we're concerned, we're not happy with what we hear, and that we urge them to uh, give full uh, rights to uh, Christians. I think that's Is a it, great thing to do. Would this be good? I think it's a great thing to do. You should write to the embassies and tell them you're unhappy about the treatment of Christians. It's good for them to know the world is watching. That's a great mm -hmm. idea. 
Yeah. Thank you, Barbara. I appreciate that. Mark, how much are we at risk? And I guess I'll limit this to the United States because this is where my citizenship is. How much is this country at risk, do you think, if we don't understand when it comes to drafting and implementing foreign policy, how much religion comes into play? For example, I point to Ahmadinejad. If this is a man who feels he's a kind of John the Baptist in the Islamic world, it's his job to bring forth the hidden imam, then all the U.N. resolutions or sanctions against that nation won't matter much, will it, if he believes he's on literally a divine mission to bring about some apocalyptic event according to what he believes the Quran teaches? But Janet, you've put your finger on a, a huge problem uh, for uh, foreign policy makers in the West, and often they are people with a very secular worldview and uh, just deny the role of religion. Um, This is influenced by Marxism, and the Marxist view religion is just an instrument of oppression. It's not something of influence in itself. And uh, it's it's influenced many social scientists, political scientists, and and thinkers. So there are lots of professional uh, terrorism analysts who don't believe religion is a part of the cause of terrorism. And uh, this is is like uh, creating governments and uh, and security agencies that are flying blind. They're unable to make accurate analyses of the problems that they face, and they're unable to understand how people get radicalised. So we are really severely handicapped if we deny the reality of Islam uh, because we'll be developing policies that actually don't make sense and are not based on the truth. Mm. Thank you for that answer. Brad, thank you for your patience in Illinois. Your question now, please, for Dr. Dury. Yeah, hi, Mrs. Parshall. I just want to first say I'm a, I'm a really big fan, and uh, thank you for your ministry. And forgive you, my sir. nervousness. This is the first time on the radio. Um, but uh, before my question, I just want to say really quick, in the end, Jesus wins. I mean, hallelujah, amen. I mean, <laughs> Jesus wins. We're, we're good. Be okay, <laughs> but uh, let me let me let me first say I'm a 32 year old man, but I'm 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 two and a half years old in Christ, so mm. I'm just thirsty for the word. I'm thirsty for everything, and um, I just love every ministry that's out there that brings me closer. But um, I was brought to Christ. I was led to Christ through the Alpha Course, uh, yes. Nikki Gumbel's ministry, the British pastor. Yes. Um, and a, f- a few years ago, it made it to the United States, and if it weren't for that, I mean, tens of thousands of new Christians, uh, maybe even more, would have never been, you know, led to Christ. And if it weren't for that, I, I just wouldn't have been saved, or, you know, all of these wonderful people I know. And I'm wondering if, if any of this would put the kibosh on what's happening, you know, on, with Nikki Gumbel's ministry in in England, or uh, the future for the Alpha Course, um, because if it weren't for that, um, you know, uh, I wouldn't have met my Savior. I, I just, you know, um, so I'm a little, you know, concerned about that, because there are people out there that, that still aren't saved. So is this going to affect the future of, like, Alpha Course and, and, and other things that are centered in London and in, in England and, and, you know, the ministers out there? As a country becomes more uh, controlled by Islamic thinking, yes, all forms of evangelism can suffer. Uh, it, it doesn't, it can't stop the power of the Word of God reaching people, but people uh, even now are converting to Christ in many thousands in Iran, and some of them are suffering. They're being thrown into prison. Um, it's very interesting. Uh, persecuted Christians who are witnessing boldly to their faith, they'll often say, don't pray that the persecution stops, but pray that we will be faithful. Involved, and I, actually, I think we have to do both. We have to encourage them to share the word of Christ, uh, but also do what we can uh, to bring pressure to bear uh, and influence to bear to to create and encourage freedom in the world, so that we are not in a situation where the Alpha Course can't be run. That that's very important that we have the freedom to tell others about Jesus. Yes, and and Brett, I thank you so much for the question because I really think, in some respects, it's put your finger on the pulse of what Mark is all about. And you go to, obviously, secular venues, Mark, but this idea of keeping the doors open for real freedom and free, free liberty affords us the opportunity to proclaim the gospel and affords the recipient the opportunity to accept or reject that good news. Let me ask you, if I may, quickly, just because we have the privilege of talking to someone literally halfway around the world, what is the state of the church in Australia? I realize that's a big question, but I watch with great interest the legal 
leader of your country who has made no apologies about her atheistic position. Do you see an influence or an attempt to try to establish Sharia law? Is there the same sort of controversy brewing in Australia as there is here in the United States? Yes, there is. Uh, The Muslims in Australia are a small minority, still just a few percent, uh, no more than that. But um, they are increasingly asking for uh, areas in which Sharia would apply. Um, They'd be very glad to have polygamy legalised, many of them. Mm. Um, And there is that pressure. Australia, in many ways, is a very secularised country. There's a lot of hostility to Christianity. And um, if you're a Christian, you have to kind of find a way of uh, of living with that. And uh, unfortunately, that also makes um, some people, their antagonism to Christianity makes people naive uh, with regard to understanding the, the impact uh, and influence of, of Islam. And uh, people don't understand the, the, the challenge and the long-term threat that it can be to the nation. Yes. Mark, thank you so much.